Hey guys, Alvin here and welcome back to another video in my aviation photography editing series. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to use Adobe Photoshop to edit your aviation photography. If you guys saw my previous video, we went through a beginner-friendly editing workflow in Adobe Lightroom for touching up your aviation photos. If you're just getting started out with aviation photography and your editing journey, or you're looking for a simple guide on how to edit photos in Adobe Lightroom, I would highly suggest you check out that video as that's where I talk a lot about the foundational knowledge and elements of editing any photo. I'll link that video up here or you can check it out in the description below. So why Photoshop? Photoshop is actually my personal favorite photo editor and I do rely on it heavily in my normal editing workflow. Number one, you have the ability to work with layers in Photoshop. The ability to work with layers allows you to have more control and precision over your editing and go into a lot more detail when you're editing. And you'll see how I utilize layers in today's edit and how I use that to my advantage. Secondly, I think the masking capabilities are a lot more extensive in Photoshop than something like Adobe Lightroom. And again, these masking tools allow you to be a bit more controlled and precise in your editing and also allows you to be a bit more creative in your editing. We won't do too much masking in today's edit as I think that it deserves a video all on its own but I will introduce the concept of it here and talk a little bit about it as we go through the edits. All right, so let's get right into it. Timestamps below if you wanna to jump to a specific section of the video. Hey, bravo. Bravo. Of course, when I'm editing, I always have a coffee beside me. All right, so now we're here in the welcome screen of Adobe Photoshop. The exact version of Photoshop we're using right now is version 21.2.11. The version you're using will probably be a bit different, but uh, the functionality and the buttons will be pretty consistent throughout different versions of Photoshop, so you shouldn't have to worry too much there. Uh, so we're going to be using Photoshop as is with no additional plugins, so no Topaz or no filter plugins. Everything you see in the video will be built right into Photoshop. In Photoshop, you don't have that kind of catalog view that you do have in Lightroom. So if you want to edit a photo in Photoshop, you're going to have to drag in your raw file or your image file. All right, so what I'm going to do is first import the photo that I want to be editing in this video. And that is this photo here of an Air Canada 787 Dreamliner on final for YBR during a summer evening golden hour. So there's some fluffy clouds in the background, some nice pink and blue tones, and there's also some nice golden light on the fuselage of the plane. That should be pretty fun to bring out in this edit. Uh, taking a look at the dialog screen here, uh, notice that it says camera raw, and this dialog will pop up when you're importing a raw image into Photoshop. Uh, again, all my photos that I work with are in the raw format. So just a quick note on the difference between a raw photo and a JPEG photo. A raw photo basically has a lot more information than that of a JPEG. A raw file contains all of the information of every pixel. What that allows you to do is to push your edit a lot further without reducing the quality of the photo. So I highly recommend that you both shoot in raw and also edit your photos in raw if you can, if your camera and your computer can handle it, because that will really allow you to have a lot higher quality in your final image. So taking a look at the section over here on the right, you'll notice that it's actually very similar to the Lightroom interface in the Develop tab. So first of all, you have the basic sliders, uh, tonal curves, you've got the, the Detail tab, with which, which includes sharpening and noise reduction, uh, the Color Mixer, which allows you to adjust individual channels of the different colors, uh, color grading, again, allows you to color grade the shadows, midtones, and highlights. Optics uh, refers to the, the lens correction and the, the chromatic aberration. Geometry is more about cropping the image and making sure it's level. Effects, I don't really use. It's just, this is to introduce some artificial grain and vignetting into the photo. And finally, calibration. This is probably talking about the the color calibration and we don't have to worry about that. 
So I'm not going to go into detail about what each of these sliders mean as I did go over that in my previous video. So if you're not sure about some of these settings, you can go ahead and watch that video first. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do an initial editing pass going from top to bottom throughout these settings. So starting off with the basic section, we have these sliders here. The white balance, again, I leave it as as shot straight out of the camera. Assuming you have your camera set on auto white balance, uh, I find that it does a pretty good job of determining the correct white balance in aviation photography. If you have some strange lighting going on, you may throw it off, but usually I don't have to do anything with the white balance here. In terms of exposure, uh, I think I'm going to go bump this up a little bit. Uh, again, if you hold Alt, you can see where your image starts to clip, where those highlights are now becoming too bright. Um, that part is just part of the wing there. I think it's okay for it. I think it's acceptable for it to be slightly overexposed. Um, I don't think it's too noticeable and it's it makes sense that that area is exposed and also the lighting, the, the landing lights makes sense why it's clipping. So let's set the exposure to 0 0.25. Contrast, let's drag that up a little bit. Uh, I do want to bring back some of the contrast in this shot. Uh, thing right there looks about good. <clears throat> Another thing I like to do is I just like to go through the entire range of the slider just to see you know, what does it look like if I drag it all the way down? Or what does it look like if I drag it all the way up? You know, sometimes you think you might know what setting you should be using for a given slider, but then you realize that, oh, maybe that actually looks better if you, you know, put it up here or you put it down here. So feel free to experiment as you go through your edit. It's not, you don't need to have like a formula of all these numbers for every photo. Every photo is going to be different. So in this case, the, the highlights, you know, I think I want to bump it up a little bit. I do want this photo to have kind of like a, a brighter feeling with a bit more light. So pushing up the highlights a little bit. Shadows, um, I think if we drag that down. As you can see that the, the belly of the plane gets pretty dark. So same with the engines. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it kind of where it is. It looks pretty good just sitting at zero there. Uh, for the white slider, yeah, that is really starting. If I push the white slider up, as you can see, it's really starting to clip on the, the wings and also the, the nose section of the aircraft. So not doing too much on the white sliders. Maybe just pushing it up to about... Uh, you know what? I'm just going to leave it right at zero again. I think that the, the whites are in a good place right now. Let's check the blacks. So if I push it all the way down, that's what it looks like. Push it up, you know, the dark sections kind of get faded. You don't want that. I'm just going to leave it exactly right where it is. And another tip is don't be afraid to leave things at zero or, or leave certain sliders untouched. A good edit doesn't mean you have to go and adjust every slider. It just means that you know, those sliders are just to fix up the photo and touch it up and make things look better. If adjusting a slider makes things look worse, then there is no point in, you know, adjusting the slider at all. So moving on to textures, again, I don't really touch the textures, but uh, if I was to drag it up, drag it down, you can see on the, I guess this will affect the fuselage of the plane a bit more. Again, I'm not going to touch the texture slider. Clarity, I do like to bump up a little bit just to give a bit more definition. Uh, nothing much at all, just around 10. And let's check out the dehaze slider in this case. Now, dehaze here really brings out the clouds and the colors in the clouds especially. But I don't want to go overboard as I think that will, you know, make things look way overdone. In this case, if I do dehaze 100, that looks way overdone there. So again, the dehaze slider is something you need to be very careful about and not to overdo the dehaze slider. So I think in this case, you know, 30 seems to be in a good place. You can always zoom in and just check different spots to make sure nothing is going weird. 
in different sections. So coming over to vibrance and saturation, someone in my previous video actually commented uh, and, and told me what the difference between the vibrance and saturation sliders are. So, so thanks a lot for letting me know. The saturation slider, if you slide that up, it will go ahead and add more saturation to all the colors in your image evenly. On the contrary, for the vibrant slider, as you slide the vibrant slider up, it will affect the lesser saturated colors more and bring that up to a level that matches the most saturated colors in your image. And so I guess the vibrance is a bit, it tries to be a bit more smart with the way it's saturating colors and not just, you know, doing everything across the board. And personally, I find that dragging the vibrant slider gives the look that I want to achieve a bit more than the saturation. So again, saturation just kind of affects all the colors evenly, the same strength, but the vibrant slider affects colors a bit more in a smart way where it bumps up the saturation for the less saturated colors to match the level of the more saturated colors. So I, in this case, what I'll do here is probably bump the, the vibrance up to maybe something like 30, around 30. I think that looks pretty good. And I'm not gonna touch the saturation slider. So again, thank you for commenting that on my previous video. Again, if you notice anything that I'm doing incorrectly or that I say incorrectly, definitely let me know in the comments. I don't claim to be an expert on any of these editing software. I learned all of this as I went, you know, just kind of experimenting. So definitely let me know if you find a better way of doing something. I can learn just as much from you guys as you guys can learn from me. Learning is always a two-way street. So I think we're done with the basic sliders here. Actually, I think what I'll do is I'll drag up the, the shadows a little bit more. I do want the, the belly of the plane to be a bit brighter. That's kind of like the style that I like going for. Uh, we'll put the shadows up at 90 in this case. All right, so I think we're about done with the basic section. Let's close that off and open up the tone curve. So in this edit, I'm actually gonna use the tone curve a bit to add a bit more contrast, a bit more punch to the photo. The left section here represents the, the shadows. If you hover over it, actually, you can see what it represents. The shadows moving into the darks. And then over here are the light colors. And up here are the highlights of the photo. And this is overlaid on top of the histogram. So the histogram represents the amount of pixels in the different um, tones. So, so the pixels over here are the shadows and the darks. And you can see there's a large group of pixels up here that are in the lighter sections. And that makes sense for this photo as the photo is a pretty bright photo. You know, there's a lot of light on the plane. You know, the sun was still up in the sky. So there, so the sky was still, still pretty bright. And that's why you have this kind of histogram curve like this. So an easy thing you can do with the tone curve to add a bit more contrast and to give it a bit more punch to the photo is if you kind of draw an S shape on the curve. For example, if I make a point here and I drag that down, this is making the dark pixels a little bit darker. And if I put another point up here where the lighter pixels are, you drag it up, that will add a bit more exposure to the, to, to the brighter pixels. So as you can see, there's kind of like this S shape here and if I go and toggle this on and off, if I toggle it off, back on, as you can see, you see that? Like there's, just by drawing that S shape, it adds a little bit more contrast and a little bit more punch, especially to the, you know, kind of the, make the bottom of the fuselage a bit more defined, a little bit more punch in the clouds. I think in this case, the dark's a little bit too dark for my liking, uh, so I'm gonna drag that a little bit higher. Let's look at that again, toggle this on and off, like that. And just by drawing that little S shape, it makes quite a difference in how the photo looks overall. So that's it for the tone curve. Moving on to the detail section, here is where we talk about the sharpening and the noise reduction of the photo. So I like leaving the sharpening to the very end. So I'm just gonna go and drag the sharpening all the way back down to zero. We'll apply the sharpening effect at the very end. For noise reduction, you can apply a bit at the start or you can choose to apply some at the end of the edit. Or some people, in my case, sometimes I actually do both, applying some noise reduction at the start and also some at the end. So the reason I do noise reduction at the start is I don't actually want to go and 
exaggerate any of these noise details through my editing. If I just leave it here and I edit the photo, I'm going to bring out this, these noise details and I don't want that in my final image. So I'm going to do a light pass of the noise reduction initially. At the end of the edit, I'll probably do a second pass just to get rid of some of that noise that came out through the editing. You don't want to overuse the noise reduction because the photo will start to become kind of blurry. In this case, I think what we'll do is we'll just set it at 60 and then we'll use some sharpening at the end to you know, kind of bring back out the edges a bit more. Let's close up the detail tab, put this back into view. So I'm actually not gonna do anything in the color mixer here. I'm going to save the editing of the different colors for later on when I'm using layers. Similarly with color grading, I'm not gonna touch any of these settings. We can just go ahead and check those two options that will remove any chromatic aberration in the photo and also apply the default lens profile correction based on what camera and lens you're using. So in this case, if you expand that, you'll see that I was using a Sony camera with the 200-600 millimeter lens. That's all you have to do in the optics section. The geometry, I don't do anything here for the cropping and the alignment. I like doing that uh, outside of this view. Same for effects. This is to introduce some artificial grain and to apply any vignetting, which we won't do in this photo. And finally, calibration tab is just talking about the, uh, the different color profiles and color calibration of the photo. So you don't have to worry about that. So once we're done with the initial edits on this camera raw dialogue, all you have to do is go and click open and that should bring up the photo uh, with those edits applied uh, on a single layer. Okay, so now we're in the actual workspace of Photoshop. First of all, if your Photoshop doesn't look like the kind of layout I have here, go up to Window Workspace, make sure Photography is checked. That will switch your workspace from uh, whatever workspace you're on into the Photography one, which should give you access to um, the, the toolbar over here on the left, as well as the History, and most importantly, the layers window over here. We're gonna be using the layers window pretty heavily, so make sure you have the layers window open. And if that still doesn't show up, go up to window and make sure that layers is checked and that you can see that in your Photoshop screen. So before we do anything, let's go ahead and duplicate this layer so that our, our edits will be applied on a new layer. So go on right click background layer and go to duplicate layer the first thing we're going to want to do is to fix up any dust spots or imperfections in the photo. So I'm just going to call this layer Fix Dust Spots. Click OK. And what are we going to use to fix those dust spots? So when you're taking photos, inevitably you're going to have some small dust elements on your lens or your, on your sensor that could result in dark spots on your image or maybe you know a bird flew by or maybe there are some things in the background that you just want to get rid of because it looks unpleasant in your photo or it is a distraction in your photo so for example if i zoom in here on the top right you can see that there's a dark speck up here so the first tool we can use to remove these dust spots is the spot healing brush tool and that's this band-aid looking icon over here with a dotted loop coming out of it uh, so let's click that and before we do anything let's go up here and check the brush settings set the size to something that will cover the dust spot and overlap a bit more so maybe 100 looks good here maybe 120 and set the hardness to something like 30 percent the hardness talks about you know how strong the brush is a zero percent hardness brush has like a kind of like a soft edge a feathered edge while a hundred percent hardness you can see the this representation up here it, the the brush is a lot stronger the edges you have a lot more defined edges. If you drag it down to zero, the brush becomes a lot softer. In this case, we'll use something like 30% will be good, and you can leave the other settings alone. And all you have to do is left click on the dust spot there, and it'll magically disappear. What it's doing, it's actually just trying to be smart and looking in the area surrounding it, what are the different colors uh, and the different tones 
and it will try to be smart and help you fix those dust spots without you actually having to do anything. So that's one way to fix up those your dust spots. So what happens if your spot healing brush actually doesn't do what you want it to and it doesn't correctly remove the dust spot? You know, maybe it's it tries to be smart, but it's actually not that smart in that case. What you can do is grab the clone stamp tool here that looks like this icon with a stamp. What the clone stamp tool does is actually it can use the colors of one part of the image and apply it to another part of the image. And what you can do is basically grab a portion of the sky that has the color that you want to replace the dust spot. So let's say if I hover over here, I hold Alt. Uh, I'm on a Windows, so I'm holding Alt. Hold Alt and left click. That will sample the color from this part of the image. And then when you're over here, just left click again without the Alt. And that, you can see, that will uh, remove the dust spot. So I think actually I sampled a bad portion of the image that is a bit darker. But maybe what I can do is a sample image over here, which is a bit of a lighter blue. Alt left click, and then let go of Alt, bring it back over here on the dust spot, and just paint over it. And this is a more manual process than using something like the spot healing brush. But you would use the clone stamp if the spot healing brush wasn't doing what you intended it to do and it's actually messing up. So those are two different ways you can get rid of dust spots. So that looks good to me. I don't think there's any other dust spots in this photo. So what do I want to do next? I actually want to bring out some of these clouds over here a bit more. I think there's a lot more detail and definition in the clouds that we can bring out. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and duplicate um, the latest layer. Duplicate layer. I'm going to go call it uh, Darken Clouds. Click OK. So what am I going to do to darken the clouds? One thing I like doing is to go up to Filter and open up the Camera Raw Filter. And you'll notice that this is the same screen that we saw when we first imported the image. But this time, you'll notice that all the, the settings are back to zero again. They're zeroed out. So this means that all of the edits we did before are already baked into the image that we see here. And everything we adjust from here will be edits applied on top of that. So what I like doing is I like to grab a graduated filter and go from the bottom to the top. You can also go from top to bottom, but I like going from the bottom to the top and just dragging down the exposure a tad to make those clouds a bit darker and just to drag up the decay slider a bit to bring back some of those cloud definitions. It does affect a little bit on the plane, but we can deal with that later. You can go down here to this button to toggle those edits on and off just to see if you like the way that um, your edit's being applied. This is a good way to just visualize the before and after. So I think that looks pretty good. I'm gonna go and click OK. So now I'm gonna talk about masking and how we can use that to our advantage here. So after darkening the clouds, I noticed that the plane actually became a bit darker because of the, the exposure that we dragged down on that graduated filter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down here and click add layer mask. So that will create a mask on top of the layer that you had selected. So first of all, to explain the concept of masking, it's a technique that allows you to control uh, where your adjustments should and shouldn't be applied. So if you have a white mask, white represents where you want an, a specific edit to be applied. Whereas if you have a black mask, black color in masking represents where you don't want things to be applied. So in this case, by default, Photoshop creates a white layer mask on top of this layer here. And what this means is that this layer is being fully applied to the layer that it's on top of, in this case, the second layer. If I was to grab a brush, so use the brush tool, and select a black color, and making sure that the layer mask is selected, just drag your brush across the image. You notice what happened there. That streak that we dragged across the image, it became lighter. And that's because that section that we just drew on is no longer showing the edit that we just did in the camera raw filter where we decrease the exposure with the graduated filter and we made the clouds darker. You can see if you look closely at the layer mask, 
icon, there is that black streak there, which means everything else is being affected by that graduated mask, except that streak that you just drew over here. And that's because you used a black brush to draw over that. If you were to grab a white brush again, having the layer mask selected and just paint that back in, that edit has returned. The, the graduated filter is now affecting that section of the sky again. So this is a really powerful concept in editing where you can use layer masks and while painting different sections, either a white color or a black color, will allow you to control where you want it to be applied and where you don't want it to be applied. For example, we applied a graduated filter from the bottom to the top, made the clouds darker, but that also affected the brightness of the plane. And maybe I don't want it to affect the plane. So let's see what that looks like. So with the brush tool selected and the black color, I'm just gonna go and paint over the plane so that the edit is not being applied on top of the plane. And watch what happens. The graduated filter that we just added is not being applied to the, the fuselage of the plane anymore because we just painted that section black. And similarly, I can just paint out the engine, maybe brush a bit more on the, the belly of the plane. And just by doing that, we toggle this layer on and off again. You can see that your graduated filter is being applied mostly to the, the sky and the clouds around the plane, but it's not really affecting the body of the plane at all. Now again, you can be really detailed with masking. You can go and trace the entire plane with the pen tool. We're not gonna do that in this video for the sake of time and simplicity, but you can be really detailed with your masking and that's what takes up a lot of time in editing if you were to go in super detailed. So that's the concept of masking and you can use that on any layer you choose. Maybe there's a certain edit that you want on only a specific section of the image. You can use masking to your advantage to control which part of the image you're focusing your editing on. So for my next step, what I actually like doing is to bring back some more brightness on the plane. How I'll do that is I wanna create another layer with all of the edits I have applied so far. So I'm gonna right click on this layer while holding the Alt key on my keyboard and click on Merge Visible. What that will do is create another layer with all of your edits applied so far. And you can go and rename this to something like Brighten Plane. So an easy way to brighten up an image is to utilize the blending options of a layer. Here in this dropdown, if you click it open, you can see all the different blending modes that you can use on a layer. You can scroll through them to see what each of them do. Uh, but the one we want to select is actually screen. The screen blending option I find does a really good job of brightening up an image. Uh, as you can see, the whole image now is a lot brighter than we, what it was before. But obviously we don't want also the sky to be brightened by this effect. I only want that effect applied on the plane. So first of all, it's way too bright to begin with. Let me just go and drag the opacity of this layer down so that the effect of it is not as strong. So as you can see, if I drag the layer's opacity down, maybe to something like 40%, that lessens the effect of this layer on top of these other layers. There's another benefit of using layers is that you can control the opacity of each individual layer to really fine tune the effect that you're going for. So in this case, I want a brighter layer, but I only want it applied at 40%. And now we're gonna use the concept of masking yet again. But this time, we're gonna apply an inverse mask. So what we can do is hover over the uh, Add Layer Mask button again, hold the Alt key, and click. You can see that it had created a black mask on top of this bright and plain layer. So recall that black means that none of the edits are being applied. What we can do here is now we can grab a white brush, click the brush tool over here, swap this around to have the white color as your foreground, making sure the brush is soft, uh, an appropriate size. Go and paint over the plane again with this white brush. The 
grab a, a, a smaller brush and can zoom in, you can just be a little bit more detailed. And just paint over the bright sections of the plane that you want kind of the, the plane to be a bit brighter. You don't have to go and trace through the whole plane if you don't want to. You can if you know how to use the pen tool and uh, masking the, the entire plane. But for this uh, tutorial, I'm just using this as an example to show what the masking can do. So if you toggle that on and off, you can see that the plane is a bit brighter because we've applied this screen effect but with a mask controlling the screen effect to be only applied on top of the plane. That was done using this inverse mask. As you can see, some of the, some of the screen is kind of spilling over the side of the plane. So you can switch back to the black brush and just trace around the plane again to just clean up your edges a bit. And there you go. Now we have this uh, screen layer that's applying a brighter effect on the plane uh, without it affecting the surrounding sky and clouds. So as you can see, we just used two different layers with two different layer masks to apply edits uh, selectively on different elements of the photo. So in this case, this layer, we were applying the edit on the clouds Whereas this layer, we were mostly applying the edits on the plane itself. So that's all I'm gonna talk about masking in this video. I'm not gonna do a full on mask of the entire plane. That I will save for a future video where I do a tutorial on masking by itself, how to use the pen tool, how to use the different uh, blending options. But I think that should give you a good start into understanding what masking actually is and how you can start leveraging that in your edits. So again, every time you're finished with a layer, uh, and if you have a mask on it, go ahead and right click it, go up to Merge Visible, and while holding the Alt key, click Merge Visible, and that should create you a new layer with all of the edits collapsed down into that layer. So what do we want to do next? So actually, I want to introduce some more color into this photo by using more graduated filters. So I'm going to go and rename this Pink Graduated Filter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and open up the Camera Raw Filter dialog again. So one way that I like introducing more color into the image is to use graduated filters. In this case, the sun is behind me over on the right and that's casting this pink hue on the clouds and also casting this uh, golden light on the fuselage. One creative thing you can do is grab a graduated filter and just drag it in the direction that the sun is coming from. So in this case, I'm gonna go drag it from kind of the top right to the bottom left there. So right now the graduated filter isn't doing anything uh, because we haven't adjusted any of these sliders here. But what I like to do is to bump up the exposures a little bit and then go down to the color section here, open it up and choose a color that matches the mood of the image. So in this case, I wanna introduce some more pink tones in the image because we're, we have kind of this cotton candy style clouds with the pink and blue tones. And so I'm just gonna go over here and select kind of like a reddish pinkish tone. Something like this. So you can see now it looks like the, the light that's being cast is a bit more pink. And this graduated filter does a nice job of having this tapering effect where the right side of the image is a bit stronger with that pink light and then it tapers off over on the left side. And so I think this, this shade of red does a nice job of giving those tones that we want. Click OK. So, and you can zoom out and adjust the length of this graduate filter a bit more so that the pinks are applying a bit more evenly throughout the image, but still stronger on the right side than it is on the left. And another thing you can do is go down to the range mask and click on luminance. And what this will do is allow you to control whether this graduated filter affects the darker pixels or the brighter pixels evenly. As you drag up this knob here, 
watch what happens to the darker section of the photo. The effect starts being unapplied from those areas. Similarly, if you drag the knob down from the top where the highlights are, watch what happens to the highlights of the photo. The brightest parts of the image no longer have that pink tone that's being applied from this graduated filter. What I tend to do is to bump up the knob on the bottom range a little bit, just so that you know the pink isn't overpowering every shade and it's leaving a bit of those darker sections untouched. So that I think looks pretty good. You can hit OK. As you can see, with that pink graduated filter being applied, it adds a bit more color to the image. It kind of changes the whole mood of the image, right? If we toggle this on and off, you can see how much difference that pink graduated filter does. And it's important that you choose a color that makes sense for the image. Like if I was to go and create a green graduated filter, that would not make any sense because you know, there, there's no green light coming from the sunset. Usually it's a combination of oranges, yellows, reds, pinks, purples. So those would be nice graduated filter colors to use. So you have to be careful about using these graduated filters and what color you uh, apply with them. But in this case, I think a nice natural color that suits this sunset type image would be this pink graduated filter. And now what I want to do is I want to fix the red tones of the, of the Air Canada maple leaf and also the text on the fuselage. I think the reds are a little bit too pink now for my liking. They should be a little bit more red. So again, go ahead and duplicate the layer and call it um, fix red tones. Now to fix different color channels in your photo, uh, you can go up to image adjustments and use the selective color option. And what this dialog allows you to do is to uh, affect different color channels of your image independently. So as you can see this drop down, we have all the different, uh, the main color channels of your photo. In this case, we want to fix the, the red maple leaf flag. So we want to have the red color channel selected. This looks a bit scary because you're playing with percentages of different color channels. You might be like, well, I selected red, but why is cyan, magenta, yellows, and blacks showing up? Uh, how do I modify the different percentages? What I like to do is just to drag that slider, you know, go through the whole range of that slider and see what it does. Like for example, I'm dragging the cyan slider from minus 100% to 100% and see what that does on the image. As you can see, as I drag it to the left, it seems like the, the red is becoming a bit more prominent and you know brings back a little of that brightness. So maybe what I wanna do is set it to around minus 50%. I think that looks pretty good. With the magenta slider, drag it all the way down and then drag it all the way back up. You can see how that affects the red tones in your image. Now obviously if we drag it all the way down, it makes things too yellow. If we drag it all the way up, it makes things too pink. So I think for this, I will drag it down to maybe something like minus 20%, just to make it a bit more red. Like before it was a bit too pink, now it looks a bit more red. And you can go and uncheck the preview button and see how that materializes in your edit, right? Similarly, you can do the same thing for the yellows. If I drag it to the left, that turns the red into like a very pink color, which we don't want. If I drag it over to the right, uh, that actually makes it a bit more red, which we do want. So I'm gonna go and bump up the yellows to maybe about 40%. And again, you can toggle the preview button on and off to see how that affects your final image. And I think that looks pretty good. And also it bumps up the golden light on the fuselage a bit. So uh, that's a win-win there. And it also fixes the, the text to be a bit more red. So I'm gonna go and hit OK. So now I'm done fixing up the red on the Maple Leaf logo and the Air Canada font. I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate the layer again. And now what I wanna do is I actually wanna darken the blues a bit more. So I'm gonna go and say fix blue tones. And again, I'm gonna go up and use the selective color option. So image adjustments, hit selective color. This time, instead of editing the red color channel, I'm gonna go and edit the cyan and blues. So first I'm gonna edit the cyan channel and just bump up the black percentage. And this will make the, you know, the cyan tones of the image darker because we're adding more blacks to it, which will make it darker, if that makes sense. 
Similarly, you can go and choose the blue color channel and also bump up the black percentage. Hit OK. Now, staying on the same layer, now I think that the blues look a bit too oversaturated. I think I want to decrease the saturation on the blue colors a bit. So, while staying on the same layer, go up to Image again, Adjustments, and select Hue and Saturation. So with Hue and Saturation, you can also go and modify different color channels independently. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this drop down and select the Cyan channel and bump the saturation a bit lower, maybe something like minus 20. And then also going onto the blue channel and bumping that saturation down a bit. So I think that looks a bit better and the blues aren't overpowering the image now. So I think the image is starting to look pretty good with the different colors. One final thing I think I want to do is just to add another graduated filter from the left to the right, just to make the left side a bit darker than the right side. Again, to add that depth in the photo. So duplicate the layer yet again, call it dark graduated filter, and go up to filter, camera raw filter to open up that dialog again. So grab the graduated filter tool and just drag from the left to the right. And this time we're gonna drag the exposure down, maybe to something like minus five. And again, we'll use the range mask to restrict that graduated filter to only certain portions of the photo. So choose the luminance range mask option. And this time we don't want the brighter parts of the image to be as affected from this uh, graduate filters. So pulling that knob down from the top, you can immediately see that um, over here in the white sections of the clouds and also on the brighter section of the fuselage here, that graduate filter isn't being applied as strongly in those sections. Hit OK. It feels like there's a bit more depth to the photo because of the range of lighting that you introduce from these graduate filters. Uh, and toggling the layer on and off is a nice way to visualize that effect. So I think the image is starting to look pretty good now in terms of the lighting and the different colors. The final step we want to do is just to run another pass of denoise again and also to do that sharpening that we didn't do initially when we first imported the photo. So let's duplicate the layer one last time and call it sharpening slash denoise and go up to the filter, camera raw filter again. And here, close down the basics tab. We don't need to be using that anymore and go to the detail tab. And here is the sharpening and the noise reduction controls. So first let's take care of the noise reduction. So to take care of the noise reduction, let's zoom into the photo to see it better. As you can see, we've reintroduced some of that noise through our editing. So I want to go and drag up the noise reduction just a little bit to smooth it out. Maybe something like 20, 25. You don't have to use as much noise reduction because you've already applied that noise reduction once before. And now we want to go back and sharpen up the image a bit. To do that, drag the sharpen slider up to something like 100. Depending on how sharp your photo is, you may not need to use 100. And again, if you watched my previous video, you can use the masking slider to control where that sharpening is actually happening. So hold Alt and then drag the masking slider up. And you wanna get it so that only the main edges of the image are lit up in white, which means only those sections have the sharpening applied. So something like this, I think, was is pretty good. Let go. And now you can see there is some sharpening going on with the text, the you know, the engine, and the, the basically the main the main outlines of the image are being sharpened. So I think that looks pretty good there. So finally hit OK. So there we go, that is our finalized edit. I'm really liking the colors that we brought back out on the image as well as the definition and the contrast in the clouds. So at this stage, before you export, you can go and crop the image to your liking. I'm gonna go, just gonna do a standard three by two crop over here, making sure to show off the clouds nicely. I think that looks pretty good. And I'm gonna go ahead and add a watermark just to 
you know, label the work as my own and to have some minimal uh, theft deterrence on the image. Obviously it doesn't work that well because people can just crop it out, but whatever is there. So the final step is obviously to export your photo. Uh, go up to File, Export and Export As. That will open up the export dialog. The settings that I use are pretty standard. The format I keep to JPEG, quality at 100%. With, if I'm posting it on Instagram, for example, then I would just scale it down because I don't need such a large image to post on Instagram. Something like 3000 by 2000 pixels seems to do the job okay. And then just hit export. I hope you enjoyed that look into my thought process and workflow around editing an aviation photo in Adobe Photoshop. The learning curve for Photoshop is definitely a lot higher than for something like Lightroom. But personally, I really like the flexibility and the amount of detail you can put into each of your edits. Hope you learned something new with this one. If you liked what you saw, hit that thumbs up, subscribe if you wanna see more, and hit that bell icon if you wanna be notified of future videos. As always, thanks for watching, happy plane spotting, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.